Hello, good afternoon and welcome. You're watching TV3. This is Today's Woman. My name is Nuong Falong and I am sitting in for your regular host. Today we have a very inspirational show for you. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Just like every profession, you might find men and women, or even better still, an equal balance. But in the maritime world, there is a sharp contrast. In this industry, which is made up of onshore and offshore business, it has been purely male-dominated. It is over two decades, yet things appear to be slightly changing at a slow pace. This trend is what pushed me to inquire why women find it difficult to venture and rise to the top. And my first port of call was the Regional Maritime University, the premier school in West Africa established by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah who trains professionals in the industry. Here, the picture was more glaring Enrollment for women has not been encouraging over the past years. For 2016-2017 academic year, five females enrolled in marine engineering against 93 males. Two females were in nautical science class against 40 males. A 32 enrolled in port and shipping against 150 males, whilst 12 females also went in for logistic management against 35 males. For 2017 and 2018 academic year, there were six females against 104 males in marine engineering, whilst there was no female that year for the nautical science against 49 males. 74 females enrolled in port and shipping against 127 males, while 14 females were in logistic management class against 59 males. Priscilla Adam is an old student. When I came subsequently, there were a lot of guys in the class. The, the, the number was huge. I think we were about six girls out of 100 and something. In class, when you're answering questions or you want to ask questions, yeah, like the, the case, there, there are a lot of guys and you, a lady, want to stand up to speak sometimes you can be intimidated by that. So why don't we have more women in this industry? Much people have not heard about the maritime industry. It's still unknown, not discovered. The previous idea that the maritime industry was meant for men is also something. Now it comes to the idea, our tradition that this is men's job. A woman, you want to go and do it. And so some parents are scared. Merchant Navy Captain Hannah Agri made history to become the first woman maritime educator in the world. She has since been teaching at the Regional Maritime University after retiring from sea. When you come in, it's not an easy job. You need to put in your marks so as to make it. Meet Esther Jebidonko, the first woman terminal manager in Ghana with over 25 years experience in the maritime trade. Esther was the head for three terminals, Transit, Refa and the Golden Jubilee Terminal at the Tema Port, which was a man's job. It was a tough area. I recall when I was sent to Terminal 1 and I had to be the terminal manager. I had to go on the vessels and all that because we have to handle Steve Dorin and all that. You know, the Steve Doors, I, yeah, it was something else to them. And they look at me and they are like, oh. So how does she manage to cope with her family life and work? It's so time consuming. 
I have sometimes, when I was the Terminal 1 manager, sometimes I have to come to the port in the night. When I was at Golden Jubilee, sometimes I have to come to the port in the night. My family were so supportive and they still are. Now, she has risen to the position of the General Manager of the Corporate Affairs of the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, earning several awards and laurels through her hard work. What men can do, women can do. This issue of the women issue, I, I'm going to attend to my children. And, and so you, you leave office, office hours, you are un, unable to uh, complete your assignments and things. It's, it's, I think it's a thing of the past. We should live beyond that. Na Dengsua Aite is another woman making great strides on the international maritime scene. Na has refused to be bound by societal norms and charted an independent course. At the beginning, it was like they were skeptical. Can she do it? But having worked with me, they realized that no, if she sets her mind to doing it, she's going to do it. And gradually, they came to accept the fact. So the skepticism just went off and the confidence actually grew. Na says women must fearlessly sail beyond the horizon. Her joy was to see more women compelling her to fight and secure more networks to mentor and promote women to bridge the gap. Nobody will advertise for you. Nobody will show you off. But when your work is accepted and you are able to push through, you become visible and you will be able to take on any other job that is brought before you. Similarly, Kate McHugh also made history to become the first American woman to captain the mega cruise ship. International agencies and local women groups, including the International Maritime Organization, IMO, Worcester and WEMA, are pushing to get more women involvement in the industry. But how far can they work to bridge the gap? Whatever you set your mind on, you can't achieve it. We need a lot of women in this area to lift the flag of Ghana high. Josephine Frimpon, TV3 News. Accra. Hello, good afternoon, happy new year is the first edition of today's woman in 2020. It's the month of January and we are interviewing alpha women getting into their minds and finding out how it can impact you watching at home. On our first edition today, we have a woman who is herself a visionary leader and who has dedicated most of her life to nurturing and grooming visionary leaders like herself. You know, as a leader, the best thing you can do for the world is to recreate yourself. This woman has dedicated herself to doing that. She's the CEO of Emerging Public Leaders. And through an initiative called the Leading Ladies Network, she has been grooming female future leaders. Our guest today is Yawa Hansen Kwao. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Did I get it right? You got it perfectly. Right. <laughs> really good to see you it's and thank you for having you. me. It's good to see you. I love the hair. Thank you. I think there's a whole natural hair movement going on these days and every time I encounter someone and the hair is natural, there's, there's just a deep satisfaction within me. Mm -hmm. It's like a silent awakening right. of, of many people. I went to a friend's wedding uh, last week and most of the people in my year group, and I went to a Brie Girls, most of the ladies who came, I looked around and they all had locks. Mm -hmm. And I said, what is going on? You know, it's like a silent communication. Nobody's telling you to do it, mm -hmm. but you're getting to that realization yourself. How did you get to that realization? Well, I started my natural hair journey over 10 years ago. And I was just tired of uh, processing my hair. It, it was breaking out, it was falling mm -hmm. and all of that. And I think for me, it was just a, a real opportunity to embrace my true self. And so I have enjoyed having my natural hair and I've worn it 
natural for, for over 10 years now. It's been Ooh. such a, a, a refreshing journey and I'm glad to see more women embracing the natural yeah, hair yeah. as well. That's actually longer than mine. I started mine uh, some three years ago and it was mainly because uh, my, my regular hair, every time I relaxed it, I realized it was, it was as light as paper. Mm. You know, so every time I relaxed, it was, it was too delicate, so difficult to manage. And at a point I say, listen, I'm not touching this again. And it's been the best decision so well, far. Well, congratulations Thank to you as congratulations well. Congratulations to you. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be here and be really talking about leadership and yes. about really embracing self. Yes. It's something that I've been passionate about for several years. And through the Leading Ladies Network and through my work with emerging public leaders, I am really passionate about finding talent and helping people unearth the hidden potential that they already have and really embrace it and owning the parts of themselves that sometimes they struggle with, including hair. <laughs> um, so it's I, a total grooming. It is. And I've had the benefit of also studying at the Protocol School of Washington in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And through that, I've, uh, I'm certified as a protocol and corporate etiquette consultant. And so I work with companies and individuals as well. I've done that for several years. And I'm bringing all of that knowledge into the work that I'm doing with young people. So through Emerging Public Leaders, I have the great honor and privilege of working as a partner to governments across Africa to help them find talented young people and mm. to groom them for public service leadership. I really believe that Africa is on the move and if we are really going to have the benefit of a continent that is peaceful, prosperous, and just, we need a new generation of public servants. And so through Emerging Public Leaders, I have the great honor of leading a team that is helping to nurture the leadership potential of recent mm -hmm. university graduates. We work with, in partnership with the government here in Ghana and also in Liberia, and we place them into civil service uh, job roles. And so currently in Ghana, we've got 40 fellows who've been placed through the program. Are these uh, all Ghanaians? They are all Ghanaians. And really it's about finding talent that would have otherwise been diverted to the private sector. But how do you find this talent? You know, so um, for example, if I feel that I am talent, how do I position myself to be found in a way that I can, you know, be part of your grooming and be placed in public service. You do only public service. Well, through emerging public leaders, the focus really is on public, public service. service. And so our fellows are placed into public institutions in Ghana and what in kind Liberia. Of institutions and so, for example, we have fellows who work for the Ministry of Finance, mm -hmm. Ministry of Gender, Roads and Highways, Parliamentary Affairs, etc. Some who work for. Uh, um, like the office of the head of civil service, for example. Mm. And so all through these, we're giving young people a real opportunity to learn, to contribute to governance. And really the promise of good governance is that the critical services get delivered to the most vulnerable in society. And these young people are being prepared for that. Our focus is on competence and eth ethics. And so we have a leadership curriculum that all fellows go through that orients them towards what's ethical leadership, how to boost their productivity and be competent and deliver at a high level. And this is just one of the things that I get really excited about because I'm seeing um, in the short time that we've been doing this in Ghana, we've had really great reviews from the institutions which these fellows have been sent to. And then through the Leading Ladies Network, I volunteer my time to teach women. Mm. I'm really passionate about seeing women emerge as leaders and I do think that this is really a, a moment for women you know the African Union declared 2010 to 2020 the mm -hmm, decade mm -hmm. of the African woman and I do mm -hmm. think that it's you know we're seeing a lot of women break out of the shells and do things that were unprecedented and I do believe that by nurturing the leadership potential of of girls today we can influence the the women leaders that we produce tomorrow mm. so we've been mentoring we've We've been going to campuses we've been you know we have a coalition of volunteers who support us in doing that and it's been really powerful to see the lives of young girls transform the light gets switched on and they unearth um, the potential that they possess and I think my personal vision and orientation towards leadership development is that every woman is a leader mm. And our job is to just unearth the leadership potential that they already possess. But are there certain qualities you look out for in your candidates? For example, uh, maybe academic excellence, uh, confidence. What, what do you look out for when you meet a potential candidate? 
In these mentoring programs for girls, we're not really very rigid. It takes time for people to discover themselves. Mm. It's not uncommon for a young woman who's in college, university, actually chosen a course of study who still hasn't figured out what she wants yes. to do. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with the mentoring programs, our focus is really on helping expose young girls to different potential career paths, connecting them to mentors who've seen a little more than they've seen, um, and exposing them to potential paths that they may take down the line. We started this year a girls' governance camp where we've been teaching young girls about governance and democracy, helping them to understand this is how government works. You have an assembly person, this is an election, and mm -hmm. some of them are coming of age and have the right to vote in the upcoming elections. And we thought it was a really powerful way of helping them understand that they are not just citizens, but they mm -hmm. are also people who have the opportunity to participate in democratic processes. Do you and have that's like leadership an, too. Is there an age range for your candidates? It's so for our mentoring programs, we focus on adolescents. And so okay. mostly between the ages of 13 and 17, Mm. Uh, we do the girls' governance camp for mm. girls who are in junior high and high school predominantly. Okay. And uh, with emerging public leaders, our work focuses specifically on recent university graduates. And we work in partnership, as I said, with the government to place them into opportunities where they can actually serve right. on the job. Is there an opportunity for these candidates to offer themselves or do you have to pick them yourself? Well, because we work in partnership with the government, that does come under certain criteria. Okay. And so you must have had a university degree mm. and then there are different assessments that you would go to in order to qualify for the shortlist. In the first year that we did this, we had uh, nearly a thousand applicants, but wow. we could only take 20. It's a very competitive, uh, very, very competitive program. But and we and who, who funds this? Uh, do the candidates have to pay anything to go through the process? So we fundraise for this. Okay. And so we have okay. multiple funders who support the work of mm. emerging public mm. leaders here. Um, and we have you know, local and international donors who support us as well. And mm -hmm. the vision really is on helping Africa develop good governance. And part mm -hmm. of how you develop good governance in a country isn't just about the political leadership, but mm -hmm. it's about the technical expertise in you know, these ministries and agencies that are actually doing the work of policy formulation, doing the work of implementation of projects. And so that's right. why our focus really is on that level, that if we can fill the future future talent pipeline for the public service with competent and ethical leaders. It goes a long way to make sure that governance um, is effective and can actually do what it's supposed to. So you do this in several countries. I also follow you on Facebook and I see that you're often busy, booked out throughout the year. Uh, sometimes you're posting from different countries. People talk about a work-life balance. Is there any such thing as a work-life balance? How, how do you incorporate it? Well, I, I like to think of my life in terms of seasons. Mm. And I think that seasons, you know, for those who live in temperate countries, you have four distinct seasons every year. Mm. So there's a summertime where it's really, really hot. Mm. There's a winter where it's really, really cold. cold. And then there are these in-between seasons mm. yeah. of spring and autumn where it's kind of warm and kind of cold, kind of, you know, a bit of both. Bit yeah. of both. And I think it's the duty of every woman to really just understand the season they're in. Mm. And, you know, I talk a lot about the seasons, three seasons, for example. Are like, you deliberate about the seasons? I am very deliberate of just yeah. really understanding. And I'm a person of faith. And so I take a little bit of this instruction from scriptures. You know, the Bible talks about the sons of Issachar who had an understanding of times and seasons. Mm. And I really think that, you know, the idea of balance is a good but incomplete concept. But I think when you think of your life in seasons, it helps you understand, you know, when to move mm. and when to just sit and be still. Mm -hmm. And so I talk about seasons because each season comes with its options. Mm. And so if you're in a season where, you know, you're, you're trying to reinvent, recreate, recalibrate, mm. you know, you might need to pack on a little more than you used to. Mm -hmm. um, 
fill that schedule, get out there. You're trying to sell a vision. You're trying to, you know, build a business. You're trying to expand something. Mm -hmm. That's a season where you've got to put the, you know, in, in the States, they say you put the pedal to the metal, mm -hmm. you know, in order to just push and accelerate, you push and stretch yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's a stretch season and those are seasons of intense growth, but you've got to be switched on in a way that in a season of retreat, you probably don't. And so you do go through these seasons. And so two years ago, for example, I was in a real retreat season. Mm. I just pulled back. You know, most people who followed me on Facebook noticed that what I stopped. Happened? Yeah, you know, where, where are, are you? you? I was in a retreat. I just needed to pause. I needed to recalibrate, regroup, refresh. I was dealing with because personal things. Because also you things. have to refill yourself. Because you cannot give from an empty cup. Yeah. yeah and so I, I think that an it's empty our vessel job. cannot give water. Exactly. Yeah. So it's our job to just understand the season and in every season you've got options mm. and so for example you know let me talk about three options that I, I discuss in in my teachings and some of it is in my book as well you know the option of delete defer or delegate that in this season I'm in a retreat you know those are the options available to me I'm gonna stop doing some things I'm going to defer a few things and I'm going to delegate some things mm. because this is a season where I need to recalibrate I need to regroup re-strategize just refuel, replenish, and rejuvenate. And in those seasons, it can be so difficult because, you know, now there's social media and everyone can see what everyone else is doing. Yeah. And so when you're yeah. in a retreat season, you're tempted because you've got people posting photos yeah, of what you they're want doing. To comment. You, you feel like <laughs> you you're being something. left behind. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be careful because if it's your season for just retreating, if you try to be out there, you'll find that you're struggling yeah, and you'll yeah, find that yeah. things aren't moving mm. and you'll find that things just aren't working out and because that's not the season for you to be out there. It's the season for you to sit a minute. Um, and again, a lot of this I draw from scripture. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. And in stillness, you know the greatness. And I think that, you know, because we are like God, it is in stillness that we reconnect with our greatness mm. to get the next fuel for your next chapter, to know exactly what to do, what to prioritize, which opportunities to chase, what to say yes to, who to say yes to, mm. <laughs> who to say mm. no to. Mm. Those are the things that mm. come to you just with ease when you sit to allow that retreat to happen. And some of us have really outgoing, choleric and aggressive personalities. So I, for one, struggle with retreat seasons mm. because you feel like you should be out there. But you, you know feel that it's, itching. It's, yeah, you're itching to be out there, but you know this is your period of isolation. Exactly. And you need to make I, I wouldn't use the word isolation. Mm. I would just say you've just got to sit and be still, just stillness. Because e even in a retreat season, you can still maintain relationships and all of that. Right. But I think that's the season where you don't make major moves and I think those who are sensitive to the leading of God or have mentors around them to help kind them understand it. you know it, you may benefit from a pause right now mm. and it takes a lot of discipline to sit and not make a major move especially when you're uh, personality type is inclined to mm. and when you feel the social media pressure or when you feel the peer pressure people who say hey you used to do this or you used to do that yeah. and it makes you feel a little bad yeah. because you know you feel like, like you're, you're not living yourself. up to what people expected you to do but you know there's a scripture in the book of Thessalonians in the Bible that says comparing themselves among themselves they were not wise mm. so there's not a there's no wisdom in comparing in comparison. because mm. my journey is separate from your journey and each person's duty is really to understand what season they're in. And my season is separate, different from your season. It's I could different. be in winter, you could be exactly. in summer. Exactly. You know what? You so I don't believe in balance. I believe right. in seasons and every season gives you options what and understanding your season helps you choose the right decisions, make the right decisions and, 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 you know, take the right options. So you, well. you, you, you seem very inspired. I love that you, you're inspired a lot by scripture. Uh, you mentor all these people and all these women who mentors you. 
I have a lot of people that I look up to. A thing about mentorship is that sometimes you don't even need to have met the person that is mentoring you. Mm. Some people are mentoring me by a distance. Oh I just watch what they're doing. Mm. I watch how they're they responding. Know they're mentoring you? Some of them know, some of them don't, don't know. know. I've had the opportunity to meet some of the people I've admired, mm. uh, no doubt. But I mentored through people's books. There are certain blogs that I follow and I am mentored by the things that they are t telling me because it's speaking to me in the season that I'm mm. in. And I think it's important to mention that because some of your viewers might be feeling like because I'm not sitting face to face or in the room with, the with somebody, they're not mentoring me. Mm. That's not true at all. And I think the other thing I want to say about mentorship is that, you know, you attract mentors by who you become. Mm. You attract mentors by who you become, but you also attract mentors by the value you create. So I talk a lot about a woman who, you know, taught me a lot that I know about professionalism and all of that. Mm. It's because I used to volunteer my time with her. I liked wow. her and I just used to go to her and say, you know, I, I have a little time. What can I help you do? She taught me really good phone mannerisms. She taught mm. me how to receive a guest and all of that. She taught me a lot of things about people, about understanding people's motivations and all of that because I was helping her. Mm. So I, I used to go pick up her son from day school and bring him back and all of that. And just because I lingered, I was learning by watching, mm. learning mm. by the things. And in those moments, I would ask her questions and she would speak into my life. But wow. I got the access because I created value. Yes, yes. And so for those of you who want mentorship, sometimes it's not enough to just sit in your room and expect that people will, will agree to do that just because you want them to. Right. Sometimes you have to be, you know, very creative and mm -hmm, persistent mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. offering value. And then sometimes when you start to manifest your potential, you will find people come to you yeah. and say, yeah. call me. They if want you, to be part of the they journey. They want to be part of your unfolding success. Because when you become a person that is driven, that honors their word, that is just doing the Personal best value. with what they have wherever they are, sometimes you will find that mentors will find you. I've received lots of great messages and notes from people who mm. I have personally admired because they saw me doing something or heard of me through a third party and said, you know, I really admire what you're doing. Yeah. Call me next time. Call me anytime. And that's how the mentoring relation be relationship began. So for those who want mentors, physical people they can sit in front of, yeah. think about value creation. Think about what you can offer. Think about can you become a person that's mentorship mm. ready? Mm. Because sometimes we say we want a mentor, but we really just want someone to hear us. Yeah. We just want yeah. attention. Ah. We want someone to pat us on the back and tell us we're doing, doing okay. Mm. Because sometimes mentors will challenge you. They will ask, you know, I've had people challenge me and tell me that, Yawa, no, this is not acceptable. I've been rebuked by my mentors. And you have to be ready for You've that. You've got to be ready to take that feedback, even if it's negative, or especially when it's negative. Because otherwise, there's not really a benefit to people who are around you who are not able to tell you the truth. Yeah. Then the other relationship that I would encourage your viewers and listeners to invest in is what I call the ground crew. What's I think everybody crew? needs the ground crew. Mm. I, you know, I was on a plane one day and the thought just occurred to me. And I think this might have been a revelation. If I were a pastor, I'd say yes. that, right? <laughs> but, you know, I was sitting on the plane and, and recognized that as soon as we land or even when we're taking off, there are people on the ground directing this plane about where to go. They set up different cones and it tells the, the, the plane the boundary in which it can move. And I thought to myself that, wow, you know, planes are one of the most advanced pieces of technology that are known to man right now. But in spite of all of that technology, they still need the ground crew. Mm. In spite of all of the heights that these planes can climb. In fact, these next generation mm. planes, they essentially fly themselves. Yeah. But in spite of all of that excellence they've got, they still need the ground crew. Yeah. And I think it's the same for us. To no matter how hard, no matter, no matter how high we climb in terms of success, we need the ground crew. Mm. People who can speak to us, people who can tell us when we're out of line, mm. people who can give us feedback and, and speak frankly to us. Because sometimes you will recognize that the higher you go, nobody tells you the truth anymore. 
Yeah. Everybody just wants yeah, you to believe. Because ultimately, your good side. Everybody wants you to believe that you are the bomb.com. <laughs> <laughs> they want you to believe that you know there's nothing bad mm -hmm, about you, mm -hmm. but that's not true. Mm -hmm. And so you there have to some. be deliberate about cultivating these relationships with people mm -hmm. who will say, you know, it was good, but it could have been better. I've seen yeah. you do better. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And then yeah. the other piece I would say is if you are the only oga in your group, you are in the wrong group. Mm. You want to surround yourself, you know, you want to think about the nearest and dearest to you. If they are so impressed by the little things that you do, you need a new crew. Mm. I think you it's need... a saying like, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Yes. Something like that. Yes. Yeah. And so you want to make sure that you are constantly surrounding yourself with people who are challenging you to stretch yourself. Okay, you did this last year. Okay, good, good. But have you thought about doing this? Mm -hmm. Or people whose successes are inspiring you to think bigger. Because I, I do think that sometimes we achieve a little and we're the biggest fish in the pond mm. and that's enough. Then you get complacent. And I think that there are people listening to us right now who need to be challenged to get out of their comfort zone. To say, yes, you've got a little bit of success. You're the most successful sibling in your family, but there's more that you can do. You're a family champion. You're now, the family you, champion. Can you be a community You're champion? You're the area <laughs> champion. We want you to be national champions, mm. international champions. Mm -hmm. Can you mm -hmm. take that business to the next level? Mm. Can you take that, um, you know, enterprise to the next can level? You can you challenge? Mm. Can you challenge yourself? And I think that that's the hope of this new year, mm. that we can now start thinking. You know what? 2019 was all was all right, but 2020, can I press on? Big moves. Can I push <laughs> forward? Can I do more? Because the God that gave you 2019 and all of its goodness and bounty, I believe, wants to do more in 2020. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's our job as children of God, to expect more. Because, you know, there's a scripture that I really love. And it says, the expectation of the righteous shall not be cut off. And I think that that's... That's the spirit in which I'm, I've entered 2020, mm -hmm. that my expectation will not be cut off. I'm expecting big things. I want the best of God, not just the crumbs. I want the best. And I want to encourage all of your viewers, all of the women watching all over this country to believe God for the best, mm -hmm. to stretch yourself this year, mm -hmm. um, to surround yourself with people who will challenge you, to be humble enough to accept rebuke when it comes. Yeah to be humble enough to take feedback when it's needed, mm. but just to keep on pressing and moving forward. Because I think that success comes to those who are resilient. Resilience. There's another scripture I love, Resilience. which says that the hand of the diligent shall rule. Hey. If you wanna rule, mm. you've gotta be diligent. You've gotta keep at it, even when nobody's watching, mm -hmm. even when nobody's giving you the time of day. I remember decades ago, we would organize programs and maybe two people would show up. Oh, and now dear. we're oversubscribed. We can't, we can't handle, handle the demand, the, yeah. you know. Because you kept going. Because we kept, and you no, kept... because we kept being diligent. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. my point. You wanna be diligent because if you keep at it and if you take the feedback and if you keep working on it, you keep perfecting it. Little by little, mm. little by mm. little things improve. And so one day you will be the one who's turning down opportunities yeah. because your calendar is Opportunities full. you were chasing. The things that you were chasing, when they start to chase you, you will now start to, you know, have choices in a way mm. that may seem, mm. you know, like you're a little too known, you're a little yeah. too, you know, yeah. You know. Yeah, but you have to accept your growth also. Let me ask you something. Now, um, in the middle of all this excellence, we have a very basic Ghanaian uh, concept of people being afraid of powerful women and women who are achieving, uh, women who stand their ground and are out there roaring. What, what do you think women uh, who are aspiring to that point should think about? Should this be something we care about? Should we just um, be ourselves and assert ourselves as much as we can? You know, I believe fundamentally that you are who you need to be mm. to do what God has called you to do. And I think instead of expending time and energy on what other people are thinking about the who God has made you to be, let's invest that time in just being the fullness of what God has called you to be. Because I think that the more you're running a race and you're giving attention to all the spectators and all of the people, you're so distracted that you stop running and you stop winning. Mm, and I think that, you know, it, 
essentially, you want to surround yourself with people who give you feedback, mm -hmm. constructive feedback that helps you grow. Mm -hmm. But if you spend all of your time worrying mm -hmm. about people's opinions of your success or your choices, then I think that you are self-sabotaging. Mm -hmm. You are causing yourself yeah, to not yeah. succeed. It's like a burden that you know slows you, and then you're not moving as fast as you can. It's a burden we weren't designed to carry. That's why it slows you down. Mm. Because I think our job is to leave our reputation to God. Like that's my personal mm. opinion. Mm. I leave my reputation to God and Amazing. say, you know, God, I do feel like I'm doing what I need to do, and I do want, you know, the love, the goodness, the kindness. Mm -hmm. I want to treat people right. right. This is not about, you know, being disrespectful to people, but I want to do the best that I can. Mm -hmm. And I follow the scripture, which says that as much as possible, live peaceably with all people, mm -hmm. which means sometimes it's just not possible. Right. You know, you want to have peace. You want people to not have anything contrary to say about you. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people are just determined to misjudge you determined to fit you in a box that you weren't designed to be in. And I think that it's our job to do the best that we can to honor God with our gifts. And sometimes allowing people's opinions of how we pursue excellence or how we're pursuing the, the, the purpose that God placed on our lives just detracts us from the actual purpose itself. So I don't even wanna expend that energy mm. thinking overthinking because I have my counsel, I have my ground crew who right, I ask. Right, and you they know, know you. They've known me for years. Yeah. They know what motivates me. They know what moves me. And it's their opinion that I value. You know, I feel like I'm in a social, professional, spiritual sermon, all mixed together. And you know, there's another question about mentorship I wanted to ask. When, when we're seeking mentors as young women, should we be looking at people whose mentorship align with our chosen career paths? Or can we just pick people because, for example, if I'm a lawyer, can I be mentored by an architect because I see her or him embodies certain principles and th trades that I want to embody? I think mentorship, you must always keep an open mind because mm. I'm mentored by people who are younger than me sometimes. I just, I am... a astounded sometimes about by the things that I learn from young people. I mm. give a lot of my time in mm. mentoring programs mm. and I leave those just as enriched as the, the young girls claim they are by me. So mentoring is an exchange mm. and oftentimes you get the best results by people who are so far removed from you. Mm. People who are just off the track, you know, and I remember, you know, just there are some songs, for example, hip life, rap songs that you listen to the lyrics and you're like, oh, my God, this is very wise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so sometimes when you put yourself in a box about where wisdom comes from or who can be a blessing to mm -hmm. you, you may miss the gems that are right near you. And mm -hmm. sometimes mentoring can happen at the peer level. Mm -hmm. You may have a classmate who's gone a little further than you. You can also have the humility to say, you know what, can we meet once in a while? Yeah, can I just be bouncing yeah. stuff off of yeah. you? Yeah. Because, you know, sometimes the wisdom you need is at your level. It's not someone who's mm -hmm. 20 mm -hmm. years ahead mm -hmm. of you. Mm -hmm. It's not someone who's five years behind mm -hmm. you. It's someone who's at par. And very accessible. Who's accessible, yeah. who understands where you are in life, who probably is at the income level that you are, is having the same struggles with family life that you are. And sometimes the wisdom can be found right at your level. So with mentorship, there really is no formula. You can be mentored by people who are older, who are younger, people who are in different industries, people who have varied backgrounds than you. Because mentoring is just that great gift that God has given us mm. to interact mm. and benefit from each other. And I don't think you need to put yourself in a box when it comes to choosing who gets to mentor you. But slightly, let's move away from mentorship. Let's talk about your book, which you released just last week, a few days ago. What, what? Correction, I wrote this book seven years ago, actually. Oh, so wow. I have finally launched it. Wow. You know, this book I wrote in 2012, I, I believe. And, you know, almost immediately I, I printed my copies. Mm. I was invited to speak at an event in South Africa and they bought all the copies. Wow. And so anytime I travel and I'm speaking and I've been, you know, sharing it 
personally. I've been, you know, with mm, events that people. I speak at, but I never formally launched it. Wow. So some of my ground crew were telling me that, you know, you you're working on your second there. book, but nobody knows that you the wrote first a first one. book. <laughs> so we formally launched uh, the book this, uh, this past weekend, mm. and it's called Daughters of Zelophehad. And, you know, I just believe that this is a word in season. You know, this book, I wrote it through inspiration. I chanced upon this very little known Bible story in the book of Numbers mm -hmm. chapter 27. Mm -hmm. It's a story about five sisters. These are five women who were the daughters of a man named Zelophehad, and he had passed away and did not have any sons. And according to the law of Israel at the time, women could not inherit their fathers. Properties. And mm. these women, back in Old Testament days, before feminism, before you know women's rights and girls' rights, you know the Bible says that these women went to Moses, who was essentially the president of Israel. Mm. They went to Eliezer the priest, who was essentially the pope of his time. And they stood in front of the whole congregation of Israel and asked that they be given their inheritance. And the Bible says that when Moses went to God to ask and said, God, you know, these women are saying I should do this. God answered Moses and said, what they're saying is right. Mm. And I believe that this is proof that God not only condones activism, but he blesses it. You know, I tell my friends God is feminist and they don't understand me. And I usually say, God believes that all humans are equal. Essentially, this is one of the basic principles of feminism, demanding equality. And so if even God agrees that we're equal, he must be feminist. So, so how do you tell women to, to you know, try to shut them down when they're demanding equality? And, and you know, what you're saying right now just feeds directly into that for me. So I drew leadership lessons from this story and I have impacted them in this book. So that's what this book is about. Right. It's for women who believe that they're meant for more, mm. who feel that, you know, deep down, I know God is calling me to something big. I don't quite know it yet. And my circumstances don't quite reflect it yet. Nobody sees me. I feel unheard. I feel invisible. But I know there's greatness in me. I think this book is for you. For husbands who have wives, who have lost their mojo, who have lost mm. the vim, <laughs> who need to, to have that spark reignited. For people who are trying to really get themselves back onto that path of excellence, on high performance, I believe this is your book. And mm. so I have, you know, by God's grace, had the opportunity to just talk about and share this book all over the world. And I felt it was befitting to actually formally launch it in Ghana because you know what, this is my country, this is where I'm from, and I really want people to have the benefit of, of the knowledge that I believe God gave Thank me. Thank you very much. Now we've been speaking with the CEO of Emerging Public Leaders, Yawa Hansen Kwao, and she has left us with many, many, many gems, especially for 2020, for you to go out there and have some impact. I will remember to be diligent, be resilient, add value to myself, and go for more. You're still watching Today's Woman on TV3. We'll go for a quick break. When we come back, Today's Woman continues. Don't go away. And that does it for another inspiring and impactful Saturday on TV3's Today's Woman. Join us again same time next week. My name is Nuong Falong. Good afternoon.